Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. By the time this interview goes to air, you'll be, to all intents and purposes, locked away. I would assume so, yes. Australia's greatest con man, John Friedrich, took the banks for hundreds of millions of dollars. It was the biggest fraud that we'd ever had. In the fast cash time of the 80s. He got $104 million from the State Savings Bank that uh, he didn't even ask for. As he turned the National Safety Council of Australia from a non-profit into the biggest search and rescue organisation in the world. He didn't see problems, he saw opportunities. But when his criminal master plan unravelled... He was just a straight out thief. <laughs> an even greater deception was laid bare. We don't know, in fact, whether you're John Friedrich. Investigative reporter Adam Shand sets out to discover the real John Friedrich. He must have felt like he was on borrowed time. He stole $293 million from the banks. But where did all the money go? It was no great demonstration of wealth. I was a financial journalist back in the 1980s. It was an exciting time in Australian corporate history. That is, until a lot of people lost their money. Lending limits were coming off, the dollar was floated, and suddenly there was massive competition between the banks to lend. All they needed was a good story. We remember names like Bond and Scase, but there was another empire builder who also came unstuck at this time. John Friedrich was just as bold and audacious as any of his fellow entrepreneurs. We're driving into Sale in Victoria's Gippsland region because this is where John Friedrich worked his massive con. And let me tell you, it's an extraordinary tale. During the 1980s, West Sale Airport was the thriving base of operations for the Victorian branch of the National Safety Council of Australia, led by John Friedrich. One man who knew him from the start was Barry Whitehead. He rose to become senior operations officer. Plenty of activity back in the day, but uh, all very quiet now, Barry. How do you feel coming back here? It's quite strange. Uh, obviously, it brings back a lot of memories, but it, it, it's all in a positive sense because uh, the, the feeling of success and achievement, uh, despite what ultimately happened. So, Barry, how did you meet John Friedrich? Uh, well, John, uh, back in 1978, started as a, a, a safety consultant, advisor on emergency response fire protection at your lawn power station. And uh, I was working for the Victoria State Emergency Service. Uh, we had several conversations over a period of time and uh, it, it led to him offering me a position with uh, the National Safety Council. He rose to the ranks very quickly. Why did that happen? Um, part charm, part uh, um, achievement. He was actually achieving things, and I guess any employee who uh, achieves like that is, is, is ultimately rewarded. But, you know, there was a certain amount of JF charm in there as well, and uh, he certainly knew how to, I guess, stroke the egos and, and please the right people at the right time. <laughs> As Friedrich's ambitions grew, so did the National Safety Council. From a minnow to a whale, all of it based on lies told by John Friedrich. Well, in order to keep the company going, you had to present a view of what you were doing, or what it was all about, uh, which was effectively lying to everybody. And you were the person perpetrating that lie? I was the person maintaining that lie. In 1991, George Negus was the only reporter to interview Friedrich after his cover had been blown and his massive fraud had been exposed. What was the lie? 
how the organisation was financed. Well, tell us how it was financed. Well, the organisation was principally financed by borrowing on non-existing assets. By that you mean the empty containers that we've heard so much about. Why was it so easy? At the time, it was a period of aggressive lending. So you'd go to a bank or a financial institution? No. They came to us. They thought they were lending money on full containers. But they were empty? Yes. You knew they were empty? Uh, I certainly didn't know they were empty, yes. And nobody said to you at any stage, do you have the assets to justify these borrowings? Well, they may have asked the question. We, we would have persuaded them. I would have persuaded them that they have, we have. So that was, that was the big lie? Oh, yeah. That was a period of time when he could get a, a loan of $12 million on a handshake without paperwork. You and I might spend months arguing over 100000 He could literally have bankers ring him up and ask him, do you need any money? Um, and that involved the State Bank and the Bank of South Australia. I may never get a loan again, but one of his great stories is that if you knew how to use your silverware in the dining room at the top of the bank building where all the bankers dined on their prawns from Queensland, and I'm quoting him, then you'd be able to get a loan of any amount of money. He got $104 million from the State Savings Bank that uh, he didn't even ask for. They came up to see him and, uh, and offered him $104 million. Kel, you had a lot to do with John Friedrich. Uh, tell us your memories of him. I knew him well. I was in Gippsland. I was stationed at Maul. Oh, there you go. And uh, he was only starting off in Maul when I went there in um, 1979. And he was acquiring an organisation and getting himself organised. He bought a helicopter and uh, various other items of equipment. Actually, had a ride in his helicopter. Not long after I got there, if I looked over the area, he offered me a ride. I said, why not? Right, because this is before the days of Polar Air and the search and rescue squads and the Westpac helicopter and all those types of things. I think we had one helicopter at that stage uh, in Vicpol, the first, the first helicopter. But yes, um, it was uh, handy to have his organisation there from time to time. Uh, yes, I think he could have achieved anything he set his mind to if he, uh, if he had been prepared to take the time and build it step by step. But he was impatient. He clearly impressed you, didn't he? Oh, very much so. He saw great potential for parachuting in general to play a role in his organisation. Yes. What kind of plans did he have back then? The original idea for John came from a pilot that went down in Bass Strait. Basically, at that time, if you went down in Bass Strait, no one could get to you. He came up with the idea that if they had large helicopters or fixed-wing aircraft that could travel that far, you could parachute someone down to the stricken person. You could save lives. You also saw John at his most vulnerable, there at 10,000 feet, parachute strapped on his back. We were the biggest training organisation in the Southern Hemisphere, I believe, and we had been training quite a few of the people. And I guess at some stage, John decided that if he was asking other people to jump out of aeroplanes, Maybe he should do one himself. He looks scared. And he, he should have been. Parachuting for the first time is a scary thing. If you're not scared, uh, you probably shouldn't be up there. <laughs> Looking at the photographs now, to the 2020 vision of hindsight, he does look a little bit dark. You had no idea what was going on in his mind. Absolutely not, and I don't think anybody did. In just a few years, Friedrich transformed the National Safety Council into a world leader in rescue techniques, employing 450 people. The NSC, with its fleet of choppers and fixed-wing aircraft, a 42-metre ship and a midget submarine, secured contracts across Australia, including the Federal Police and the Department of Defence. In 1988, Friedrich was appointed a member of the Order of Australia in recognition of his outstanding achievements and service. I've had pause to think about this over the years, and knowing that he was a con man and a great con man, he may have started it off thinking, I can do some good for myself out of this, but I think he found a con that was worthwhile. And what he achieved in the few years he was operating was astonishing. He ended up 
really believing in what he was doing. Either that or he's just the most amazing con man in the history. <laughs> because no one that I knew saw anything other than a man committed to the National Safety Council. This was a great thing. It was going wonderfully. And then the world fell in on him. The auditors were the first to suspect that John Friedrich was cooking the books. But through sheer force of personality, he kept them at bay until 1989. That's when Kel Glare, who'd risen by then to become the Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police, received a visit. I had the then uh, Chairman, I think, Max Isey, come to me and uh, tell me that uh, he thought there was a problem. And uh, I said, well, they're your books. He said, oh, he won't give us the books. I said, Max, you're the boss. You have every right to demand the books. But until you do, and come to me and say, yes, there's every possibility of defence, I can't launch an investigation. You know, it's up to you to establish that there's something for us to investigate, uh, because they're your books. When the board of the Safety Council sought answers, Friedrich immediately resigned. Then the banks moved in, appointed a liquidator and demanded their own meeting with Friedrich. I got a phone call from uh the State Savings Bank. And uh, one of the senior managers there said he was very concerned about the money that had been advanced. And uh, they'd arranged an interview with Frederick the next day. The uh, hierarchy at the bank, the, the senior manager that I was dealing with, rang me and told me that he hadn't turned up for the interview. And that's when he, he went into the land of the missing. When we return, there's a massive manhunt as Friedrich becomes a fugitive from justice. It was almost a frenzy with everyone trying to find out where is he, and he disappeared. When Friedrich's giant corporate swindle was exposed, he vanished, sparking a worldwide manhunt. ASIO and the federal police have now joined the international hunt for NSC founder John Friedrich. We don't know where the money has gone. We're only able to say that there is uh, an accounting irregularity. Did you have a role in the search as well? Well, I coordinated, yeah. I contacted the federal police to have the passenger lists checked at airports, and I sent out a general broadcast message for other police uh, to be on the outlook for him, and I briefed my superiors and just sat back and waited then and see what pops up. Meanwhile, the hunt continues for NSC boss John Friedrich. Back in the day when you were a journalist, you were an uh, eager young reporter with Channel 10. The whole National Safety Council story was breaking. What was your part in that story? My role was to try and find out who was John Friedrich and where was the money. And it became the hot pursuit to try and beat the six o'clock deadline to lead the news. It was almost a frenzy with everyone trying to find out where is he, and he disappeared. After a 16-day nationwide search, Police received a tip-off that Friedrich had been seen outside Perth. He'd gone to a motel and it stayed there and people became suspicious and contacted the police and the local police went around and uh, brought him in. That's when they, they found out who he really was and uh, they rang us. I got my team together in Melbourne. We hopped on a plane and went to uh, Perth and went into the CIB building at Perth and uh, that's when I first met him. How did he strike you in that first meeting? Very intelligent man, well educated and, and not the usual type of crook that you, you would expect. But... It seemed Friedrich had masterminded one of the biggest frauds in Australian history. Most crimes in Australia only revolve around a couple of thousand dollars if you're lucky. <laughs> Every now and again, you get a massive one, but not very often. If it's a bank, they sort of in and out pretty well straight away, and it's just a bag full of money. But this fellow had taken millions. Quote one of the detectives, uh, he said it was bigger than Texas. Well, I was talking to the reporters at that time, and it was the biggest fraud that we'd ever had. In court today, Magistrate Ken Moore granted the Victoria Police an extradition. How long was it before he admitted to what he'd done? He, he uh, 
owned up to what he'd been up to very early in the piece, and it was he was not a hard nut to crack. I've been told about con men that they always want to tell somebody in the end because if nobody knows, no one can know how clever they were. Yeah, I think that's quite right. Friedrich was extradited back to Melbourne and sent to Pentridge, one of the most notorious jails in Australia. I remember him well, I guess, because he was not the normal run-of-the-mill prisoner that uh, was housed in D Division at Pentridge. And so I was able to call him out of the yards and down to the hospital in, um, in D Division where I used to work and uh, go over his life with him and it became more and more intriguing. It was almost a mission for me to uh, try and understand what this guy was on about because the charges that were levelled against him were pretty heavy. The evidence continued to stack up. Friedrich's scam against the banks had risen to $293 million. It was being described as the largest fraud in Australian corporate history. The media was all over it. And Frank Maguire, a young, ambitious TV reporter, was about to drop a bombshell. Friedrich turned out to be this man of mystery. What I was able to establish in a very short period of time, in this critical time frame, was that where he said he had come from was false. And John Friedrich was not his actual name. It's the kind of story you take to your chief of staff and they'd go, nah, couldn't be true. Was there a sense of incredulity about this? There was. Next, we reveal the German connection. It's the same man. The eyes and the smile. Yeah, I see him and I know it. John Friedrich had defrauded the banks to the tune of $293 million. But that wasn't the end of his deception. We don't know, in fact, whether you're John Friedrich. Well, Georgie, if I say, if I say I am John Friedrich, you don't believe it. If I say I'm not John Friedrich, you don't believe it. But nobody really knows for what you are, where you came from, what you did before you got here. Well, so be it. Despite the best efforts of George Negus, Friedrich couldn't be drawn on questions about his identity. And despite the preceding years, the complete story is still a mystery. There's at least two or three John Friedrichs that I know of. The first one who purports to be the, the head of a safety and rescue unit in Victoria, and the other who probably originated in Munich in 1950. Only his name was John Hohenberger. His first job in Germany was with a company called Strassen und Teuben. They were uh, enlisted to build roads in mountainous villages. Friedrich Hohenberger was a junior engineer and he was accustomed to ordering roads to be built in these remote little hamlets. It was then discovered that there were no truckloads of bitumen going up into these hamlets. There were no construction vehicles up in these villages. In fact, no roads had been built at all. Old friends in Germany recognised him straight away as the man who embezzled a quarter of a million dollars from the road construction company he worked for. It's the same man. The eyes and the smile, it's, it's the same. It's, uh, I, I see him and I know him. Having embezzled the equivalent of a quarter of a million dollars Australian, he faked his own death at an Italian ski resort in the Alps, and I think he left Germany in 1974. It was thought that he must have gone down a crevasse or something. Months later, a bunch of his clothes and luggage was found up in the ski slopes. So, Hornberger, he was presumed dead. He was more or less free to go wherever he wanted to in the world. His CV said he spoke some Vietnamese, he may have spent some time in Southeast Asia, ended up in New Zealand and then just wandered across the ditch to Australia. Your accent. What is it? An accent. A bit of German in there, and a bit of South African. George, I'm not a linguist. And but in order it. to ex be able to explain how accents develop, so. But you recognise that you've got one. Oh, yeah. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah. But is it reasonable for me to say if you've got that accent that you weren't born in Australia? George, we'll leave that alone. On the records that exist, Hohenberger came into Melbourne on the 20th of January, 1975, and went to Singapore on the 22nd of January. Some weeks later, a gentleman going by the name of uh, John Friedrich applied for a job with Cadell for the construction company building the underground rail link in Melbourne. What I've always wondered is, Hohenberger comes in, yep. Hohenberger leaves, yeah. John Friedrich stays. Yeah. Who was in the seat? Well, at that stage, in the airports, compared with what it is today, security there on the individuals and then on, on their uh, luggage would have been quite slack. Well, he could have got a boarding pass, yeah. given it to somebody else, yeah. and there wouldn't have been any checking, would there? No, no they, wouldn't, they didn't match them back. You, you would think he'd gone because the evidence was there with the boarding pass and the plane leaving, but you, you couldn't be sure. You couldn't... Uh, challenge it anyway. Which brings us to a dusty outback corner of South Australia called Ernabella, where a young man calling himself John Friedrich arrived in 1975 and met a young nurse who later became his wife. You met on an uh, Aboriginal station? Yes, I'd been working there for 12 months when I met John. Can you tell me what he was like in those days? Very enthusiastic and caring. Uh, he didn't tell me a lot about his past. He told me a little about his childhood. Did he tell you where he was born? Yes, in West Germany. Mm -hmm. he, he also told me he had a fairly unhappy childhood and uh, that he didn't really like to talk about. Yeah, she didn't know anything. She didn't know anything. Uh, and she told me poignantly that he never understood, as m people with John's issues don't, that all his wife and children ever wanted was him. They didn't need the glory, they didn't need him to be famous, they didn't need him to be rich. They just enjoyed him. And when he was home, when I was at his house numerous times, you could see the difference, uh, even in the body language, once he got inside his house. He was a husband and a father at that time. When George Negus interviewed John Friedrich in 1991, his fraud trial was fast approaching. Would you have shot through before this had it not been for your family? I've got three kids. Yes. You've met them, you've met my wife, you've met my kids, you've met some of my friends. Yeah. And, uh, you know, would you walk away from But had they not been here, you, well, wouldn't, you wouldn't have gone through with this? Um, would they not be here? I don't think I'd be sitting opposite you. Which was the real John Friedrich, do you think? Well, the real John Friedrich is, is all of that. The one I suspect when he was most happy was when he was home. Um, not having to pretend. Once he got outside the house, the body language would change and he'd be that A-plus personality in charge of a large organisation. Did you lose hope of ever having a normal life again? No. Um, in some ways, I, uh, I thought it was more possible once all of this was over because we'd spent more time together. And I think... Uh, that John had probably come to a wider realisation of how important family was. A realisation that he didn't have before? Yes. How difficult was it to confirm to you his real identity? Um, I, I, well, look, this is going back a long way, but there was a great discomfort uh, that I perceived in him when we were talking about Germany. He wasn't prepared to relive his childhood. Which was unhappy, as I understand. And the unhappy. relationship with his father was difficult. We, we, we talked about some of that. Um, his father um, uh, didn't see him as a person who had worth or had value, and he was out to prove his father wrong. It's, again, so the myth goes. Was he prepared to reclaim his original identity? Mm, no, not, not publicly. The idea of opening all that up to the public, when he was a man who was cheered and clapped in the community he was in, um, would have been very difficult for him to deal with. You want to stop in the middle? Tie off, take it around yourself. Friedrich's stubborn refusal to reveal his true identity 
was also related to his fear of being sent back to Germany for the earlier fraud. Only a team, a Martin Grinsberg, yep. went over to Germany yep. and discovered that the German authorities weren't, really weren't chasing him. No, they weren't looking for him. <laughs> they, they had initially, years ago, but they got a story that he had died in the snow. He'd run off and uh, they'd followed a trail and uh, they assumed he had just died there. And accepted that? They accepted that, yeah. So it could be said that he was running from his own shadow. <laughs> yes, he was. Still to come, he took the banks for millions, but where did all the money go? John wasn't building a bank account. John was building an icon. Welcome back. Unraveling the financial affairs of the National Safety Council is just one of the pieces in this rather extraordinary puzzle. The rescue organisation, uh, as Peter Wilkinson reports, may have been a front for something a little more sinister. Masterminded by John Frederick, the Victorian branch of the National Safety Council got up to some strange practices. What was a safety organisation doing providing surveillance of protesters at places like Pine Gap and the Omega Satellite Station in Victoria? Both sites heavily involved in the US Defence Network. How much did he confide in you? Um, he had um, stories about um, being flown to the American base where most of us would never be allowed, all of us just about. Pine Gap. That's the one. Um, and he had a little bit of proof that he was there. That was credible? It was credible. That was credible because there's a, if there's a photo and there's a place and there's a large plane that looks something like it's American, you think that might be credible. Um, uh, and I could understand why, because he'd had some dealings with the American, um, either Air Force or Army, about approaches to do with uh, safety, and that's the sort of people that he did approach. How did you feel, or how do you feel even now, when you hear people saying the things that are said about the council, that there was more to it than meets the eyes? People suggesting that it was paramilitary, that it had intelligence connections here and overseas, that it was a CIA front? Well, I don't think the council is a CIA front, but um, full stop. You were going to say something? No, full stop. It's not a CIA front? No, it's not. He had a passport in his name, John Fred, but he had other passports. How many passports did he have? I have no idea, but there would be two or three. Two or three? Oh, yeah. In different names? Oh, yes, uh, yeah, he, he would show me the passports. That, that was the thing, and he his idea was that um, the different names on the different passports uh, would allow him access. Uh, to various uh, institutions or bases throughout Australia that uh, otherwise you can't get in. So we had a high-level security clearance? Mm. Yes. Yeah. And he was proud of it because he was proud of what he'd set up at um, Sale. The state president of the NSCA claimed he had asked police if they knew of a connection between Friedrich and the CIA, a matter the police weren't interested in. It was not a matter for the Victoria Police then or now. It's still not a matter. It's not my concern as to uh, what is or isn't involved in the CIA. Interestingly, Ian Joblin, the forensic psychiatrist from Pentridge of the day, said he showed him several passports in different names. I wasn't aware of that, uh, but um, I knew that he had, um, I think once he entered Papua New Guinea, allegedly, um, it was rumoured he did uh, without going through the formalities. Let's put it that way. There is uh, uh, no substance in the allegations about uh, intelligence connections. That's what I've been informed. There were American service personnel seen here at West Sale Airport. Uh, what were they doing here? Did you see them? Uh, in order to develop our uh, pararescue uh, capability. There was, a, if you like, a consultancy, a collaboration with them to improve the emergency response uh, activities with the National Safety Council. And I think that it's all a, um, a conspiracy theory and that's, that's it. So no CIA, no mercenaries, no private army? None whatsoever, to the best of my knowledge, that I observed. A lot of people want to speculate. Oh, they were speculating whether he was a spy, whether he, he'd come from different other countries and what he was up to here. And, yeah. but, but you saw behind the veil and there was none of that? No, there was no, he was just a straight out thief. <laughs> the 
The period before his trial for fraud were dark and difficult days for John Friedrich. He was out on bail, so he was home with his family here. But he must have felt like he was on borrowed time. He was preoccupied with what was going to happen. We know he was thinking about suicide, but he was also talking up another possibility. You wrote that he had confided in you that he feared he might be murdered. Yes. In the year before his death, police were called to John Friedrich's house with a report of shots fired. John Friedrich's wife heard a disturbance and the former National Safety Council boss went out the front to investigate. He told police someone opened fire. When questioned by police about the shooting, John Friedrich told them he was at a loss as to who would want to hurt him. It's wondrous to think at that time he wanted to leave one last story, that this couldn't have been a suicide, but it was some conspiracy and plot to silence him before he went to jail. And uh, perhaps that was the case. Perhaps that was the case. Do you think he was murdered? No, he shot himself. Absolutely confident of that. Someone knocked him off. Closed the page with the words, the end. Just days before his death, John Friedrich recorded his final interview with George Negus. By the time this interview goes to air, you'll be, to all intents and purposes, locked away. I would assume so, yes. John Friedrich was in danger of going back to jail, or worse still, being sent back to Germany to face justice there. He may have been flashing around evidence of passports, but to the Australian government, he was an illegal immigrant, headed straight for a jail cell. And that must have terrified him. So it was here he came on July 26, 1991, the last day of his life. It's reported he left home at 10 a.m., crossed the road into a neighbouring property and was last seen walking up the steepest hill in the district. positively identified the deceased uh, person, and it is uh, John Frederick. He's found dead at his property at sale, with a bullet hole behind his ear. Mm. Suicide or murder? I think he was a bit of a Shakespearean character, yeah. and that's why I think, ultimately, because of his belief in himself, because of this character he'd created, I think he felt the only dignified, Shakespearean way out of this thing was to kill himself. Do you think he was murdered? No, he shot himself. Absolutely confident of that. I believe the inquiry has found that John died by his own hand. I have no further comment to make and would appreciate the media respect for our privacy. Thank you. Did he strike you with someone who would commit suicide? That's a very interesting question with uh, John Frederick because at no point did I consider that he was that depressed that he would shoot himself. And, um, and yet that seems to have been what happened. Uh, had I considered that he was uh, depressed and in danger of harming himself, I would have obviously taken other action. There's nothing in his profile, certainly nothing in his behaviour leading up to his death, which indicate to me that he had intended to kill himself. Nothing. What do you think happened on that day? Someone knocked him off. Someone put a nice line through the whole chapter of John Friedrich and crossed the T's and dotted the I's and closed the page with the words, the end. You've mentioned suicide several times. I don't think you mentioned the word suicide too. Pardon? I don't think you mentioned the word suicide to you. What you did say to me on one occasion was that the roof of the Rialto looked attractive, which but I took I've, to I've mean said that, that you, yes, yeah. yeah. That's how, how low you were feeling, or was that just a, a, a melodramatic comment? No, no, that's, yeah, that's certainly a consideration. And what do you think his prospects of success were in his trial? Well, this is one of my sadnesses. 
I genuinely believed that he was probably only going to do five years jail. Now, I say that as a criminal lawyer, other people might go five years, that's a lot. From my perspective, that's actually a modest sentence. I believed he would have had the, the strength to get through it and perhaps create some sort of personality in jail which allowed him to survive, um, but he didn't, he chose not to. Did it surprise you when you learnt that he'd killed himself? Yeah. yeah, I was very surprised that that happened, yeah. I thought he was a proud individual, um, capable of many things, but I don't believe he was a spy, um, but he knew he'd go to jail and he'd go for a long time. And uh, the fact is that he killed himself, uh, shot himself in the head, and uh, that was that. Why do you believe that your husband took his life? I think it was probably because he thought it would save us uh, some of the trauma that was to come. As a sacrifice for you? Yes. Following the paper trail, what happened to Friedrich's millions? He wasn't feathering his own nest. He was not into opulence and ostentation. I remember late 1980s as a time of exuberance, a time of dreams and ambitions. John Friedrich wanted to transform a local not-for-profit organisation into a very profitable global one. He was a kind of shapeshifter. He could be anything his bankers wanted him to be. That is, until the scam at the heart of it all was discovered. What would you say about somebody running from his past, comes to Australia and creates this amazing story? A mega empire, um, another Lex Luthor. Brilliant, able to engage people, manipulate. You know, he had an extraordinary business, didn't he? That period of time was a unique time where people like Bond, people like Skase could bring stories to banks who were desperate to lend, who were desperate to get involved in this expanding economy, and they were willing to believe these stories. Mm. Friedrich was another version of this. I think they're all great salesmen, and great salesmen believe in the product, you know, even if it's delusionally f not the case. Um, people like Bond, Alan started his career as a sign writer, but he was always a salesman. And I said to him, you know, you'd made millions in your 20s. Most of us would just take the money and run. Why didn't you? And he said, you know, Tim, it was never about the money. It was the deal. And with Friedrich, I'm sure the same process was in play. People uh, believed in him. Look at what he's created. To start fresh in Australia, back in the mid-70s would have been um, a godsend to him. He could have done whatever he wanted to do. He um, filled in the gaps in his CV and he more or less took every single job that came along his way. And as he succeeded, it built up momentum until finally he was in charge of probably the best equipped and best resourced and best staffed rescue firm in Australia, if not the world. The whole thing was wonderful to us. We were jumping out of our own aeroplanes, not particularly fancy or big aeroplanes, and all of a sudden, through the National Safety Council, we had big helicopters, big aeroplanes, which we got to play with, basically, while we were training these guys. So there was always that feeling of, this is something special. People have said that he thought he was Jeff Tracy of International Rescue. He did seem a very, very capable person. To use a, um, a modern phrase, he didn't see problems, he saw opportunities. And, uh, and he lived that. The fact that he had deceived everybody, mm -hmm. his wife, so many people, did he have remorse? Did he have shame over it? I don't think so. I think he thought he was doing a good job. He said to me, Australia didn't have a rescue system, and so he supplied one. But at the end of the day, $293 million was unaccounted for. Where did all the money go? You had a chance to look through his personal finances. I think he had a Rolex watch. Yeah. He had a, a property there in Sale. There was no great demonstration of wealth. Yeah. So it had all gone back into it's the It all fraud. gone back into the thing. Into the operation. Yeah. 
He lived modestly. He never profited from it. He was not into opulence and ostentation. He wasn't feathering his own nest, unlike the Bonds and the Scases of this world. Very little money went into his own bank account, but John wasn't building a bank account. John was building an image. John was building an icon in terms of search and rescue. He was being used by um, other countries, other agencies, to do things that no one else in the country could do. That's better than having money in the bank. That's a legacy. Unlike his life, John Friedrich's farewell was low-key and simple. Around 300 friends and former colleagues paid tribute to the man they saw as an achiever who created one of the country's elite rescue organisations. Do you miss your old boss? Uh, I had an enormous amount of respect for him. Uh, there are some things that he did and uh, some of the way that he went about achieving his goals I didn't necessarily agree with, but overall, what the organisation was trying to achieve uh, and what we were doing for the Australian population, uh, we all believed in that. People were given opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have, uh, and for that we're very grateful. We even had uh, a get-together at uh, a local hall, and uh, it was not about condemning or being angry about what had happened, but saying, OK, well, it's over, but let's celebrate all the good things that we did. And, and I recall that being a really great night for employees and their families. So what's out here on the site now? Uh, it's a, a TAFE college, um, but the TAFE college, they are about to pack up and relocate. Um, so there's not a great deal of activity here nowadays. Just me and the ghosts. Following his death, John Friedrich's remains were cremated and his family took the ashes away. There was no headstone, no memorial. The official records didn't even record his date of birth. The only enduring reminder of his existence is this old map of Australia in his office at the West Sale Airport. It's a quaint relic, evidence of the vaulting ambition that died with him. Of all the entrepreneurs I saw come and go, I think I'd like to have had dinner with John Friedrich. I would have too. I would have loved to have had dinner with him. And I wouldn't have minded which character he was in. I would have had a good chat. <laughs>